Hello everyone. Um, I'd like to offer you all a very warm welcome to the second in our series of Enterprise Architecture webinars brought to you by JISC Emerging Practices. Um, can I just ask everyone to give me a green tick if you can hear me all right. Um, hopefully get everyone used to using the tools and ensure that I'm not just talking into space. That's looking really good there. I'm going to assume that pretty much everyone on the call can hear me fine. Lots of green ticks appearing, so that's great stuff. Um, today's session will be facilitated by David Rose, supported by myself, Andy Stewart, and Will Allen, um, who you heard from earlier. If anyone has any difficulties, please use the chat window to let us know, and please use a prefix of question, which will help us to quickly identify any problems amongst the general conversations that might be going on. Um, Will and I have been working together to try and highlight new and emerging practices arising across a range of JISC innovation projects, very much focusing on their development and training needs. Now, the materials that we deliver and discussions around those materials will then be formalized, published, and made available to the wider sector for their use and benefit. Um, the best way to keep up to date with what we're doing is our blog. Um, in some instances, We'll be opening events up to the wider sector where resource allows us, um, so webinars being an easy way to do that. And we're very focused on sharing our learning with everyone, so please do visit the blog. And I'll just type that into the chat window for everyone. Oh, Will beat me to that. Um, so yeah, that link's in the chat window if, if anybody wants to visit that and keep up to date with everything that we're doing through those means. Our focus is on strategic ICT and in particular the following enablers, enterprise architecture, which we're covering today. Um, we're focusing on communications, especially some work around digital storytelling, and also covering some work around measurement tools relating strongly to project evaluation and the impact our projects have. Um, towards the end of today's session, we'll highlight some upcoming events, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome today's facilitator, David Rose. Well, good, good morning, everybody. And um, can I just check that everyone can hear me properly? Good. Looks like lots of green lights. So, well, welcome from me to our story today, EA, the management journey. Uh, we haven't actually got sound today, but I, I just wondered whether it should be more like roll up, roll up for the mystery tour, or maybe the long and winding road. Anyway. Any other suggestions from musicians on this session will be very welcome. Um, I'd also like to say hello to some familiar names and faces, friends who've been part of this journey right since the very beginning in late 2007. Uh, some of us have met in the last few months, and I think some, some are new. I hope um, between us we'll be able to um, come to uh, a sort of state of shared knowledge, or at least we all more or less understand what's going on, and hopefully more. So, if we look back through our collected experience of the last nearly four and a half years, uh, you'll see that leading and managing enterprise architecture is probably the biggest single challenge we've all faced. Um, Yet, it's the most rewarding one if we can get it right. Um, it's because we are about change. Enterprise architecture is fundamentally about change, and changing the way organizations do things and the way people behave, uh, working as one. And that, that, that really is why it, it can be so tricky and requires great skill. Um, we have, since the beginning of working together on EA in higher education and FE. We've presented, we've discussed, we've debated and argued about almost every aspect of the management journey. But as far as I can tell, we've not actually brought it all together in one place. So that's our aim today, to lay out this journey, take a bird's eye view, uh, and dip into some of the detail. And we'll look at the agenda in a moment. Um, I also want to say that though it falls to me to be the storyteller, these aren't just my ideas, but the experience of all of us who've been involved, mostly through the EA practice group. 
um, from the early days. And I know a number of colleagues are on the call today who've been fellow travelers. And I do hope you'll um, chip in when, when, when the time comes. So um, I also want to add a confession uh, that what I'm talking about now isn't just from within our community. But uh, it, it is influenced by what I see of the wider world of enterprise architecture, uh, much of it through my work with the Open Group, where currently we're starting out on some interesting new work to establish what is meant by enterprise architecture best practice and how organizations like ours, as well as very large ones, can assess and benchmark what they're doing and identify what needs improving. I hope that's something that we'll all be able to join in with when we get a bit further. Um, so I'll be offering a glimpse of what lies outside our walled garden. And one thing we have discussed between us is how important it is not just to learn from each other, which we've become very accomplished at, uh, but how to step outside um, the walled garden and see what others do. Because there is so much that can be learned from the wider world just as they can learn from us. Um, I'm going to make uh, a bit of a daring assumption that everybody knows at least something about enterprise architecture and has hopefully looked at the introductory webinar that we, we delivered back in March. Um, but perhaps I can just check who who's had some knowledge or introduction to, to EA. If you just hit the tick. If you if you're coming in completely cold, perhaps you hit the cross. Okay, so most of us, yeah, most of us um, know a little or more about what's going on. We've got four new colleagues. Uh, we'll do our best to um, make it clear for you. Um, some of what I'm going to be sharing with you today will be repeats of stuff you've seen before. Please bear with me, though, because it is part of the story that uh, somebody leading and managing enterprise architecture activities need to be familiar with. And I hope this slide pack will provide a useful point of reference. So on to today's agenda. On to today's agenda. Oh, there we go. Um, First, I'm going to start with a bit of a recap, getting ready for our journey um, with some new thoughts on what EA is all about from our perspective. Then we'll look at the management agenda and how that relates to our notion of the road to value and why the notion of value is so important. Then I'd like to say a little bit more than I've done before on frameworks, both frameworks for doing EA, the process, and also on uh, professional frameworks and standards and qualifications. Then we'll come to the guts of the session, uh, three key topics that always come up and that always seem to interest people. Um, I, we've kind of planned to cover them all um, in, in, in a little bit of detail, but it would be very helpful at this stage if we could just get an idea of which of these are priorities for you. So the three topics are engaging colleagues in the enterprise architecture journey, managing benefits and impact, and governance. So perhaps you could just pick one of those as your hot, hottest topic and hit A, B, or C in the little window above. Okay, we're re reasonably evenly spread. A slight preference for engaging colleagues. Okay, well let's let let's see how we, we we get on with that then. These are very much a taster of the topic, uh, which hopefully we'll be able to go on and explore in more detail in workshops. Um, then we'll finish off with a resume of where the best sources of knowledge and learning are, some of which I'm sure you'll know already. 
and then I or Andy or Will will talk about a couple of events we have coming up and the opportunity to do some more. We're also going to, round about halfway through, uh, look at taking a break uh, just for five minutes to answer phone calls, get a drink of water or anything else like that. So, preparing to travel, what's it all about? And it won't surprise you to know that, in a word, enterprise architecture is about being joined up as an organization, organizationally as well as technically. And without going too far into the definitions, uh, these are not the kind of descriptions of EA you'll see on the web or in many organizations which talk in quite technical terms. But here, this is actually about joining up the business IT and strategy to make our organizations more e effective, efficient, and ready for change and innovation um, for reasons which I don't need to explain. Um, universities are having to change and adapt very quickly. When you are talking to people about enterprise architecture, do add to these descriptions, for example, ground it in something that's real about the institution. So it is a proven and professional way of managing change. It's used by thousands of organizations around the world, and it does bring business and IT together. And therein lie some of the challenges we're going to explore. In our context, EA is probably more about a way of doing things than creating an enterprise architecture, uh, because most of us already have one of some kind. And it is always business driven. If it's not driven by some kind of business priority, it's probably not enterprise architecture. It's more likely to be IT architecture. OK, um, most of us are familiar with this one. Um, EA is about getting from where we are now to where we want to be tomorrow, from the as is to the to be. And this is a little expression, a little picture we've quite enjoyed, um, especially as it's coming up to lunch. Um, spaghetti IT. Should we just, just ask that question? Who, who would confess to having some spaghetti IT around the organization? Tick or, tick or cross. Yeah. OK. These polls are anonymous, aren't they? Aren't they, Will? Yeah. Uh, not uncommon. Uh, and we say that moving to a lasagna state is um, nicely ordered, layered, structured, much more delicious. But it does go a bit oozy and gooey around the edges, because that's what life is like. Anyway, um, don't rush out for lunch yet. Do bear with us. Um, it's quite useful to try and explain um, EA in your own language. Um, this is something that Lucy Nelson from UCLan put together right at quite early on. Uh, nice to see Lucy here today to explain in her own language and the language of her university what this is all about. So it's taken she, she's taken these fairly simple descriptions I used in the last slide to elaborate based on what she's learned by being part of our group. So I'm not going to go into this in, in detail. But um, this description does quite usefully talk about how, what joined up means and the linkage between the business layer, what the organization's about, the service layer, and the technology layer. And we'll look at that in a diagram again. OK, so here's a, a kind of simpler diagrammatic version of those layers. And it's no coincidence that these layers more or less follow the structure of the Archimate modeling language, which, if you're not already familiar with, as soon as you begin to look at modeling and using the GISC Archie tool, you will come across. So what makes I enterprise architecture different is that it does start with the business of the organization, the vision, the mission, and the strategy. One very interesting exercise we do when working with um, workshop groups within institutions, often from within IT and business analysis, 
is either to ask what the organization's mission is and the IT department's mission, or show it and ask how many people realize. And it's really surprising how many people have never seen it before or don't know the answer to that question. But that is where it starts. IT architecture is about the lower part of that diagram, and service-oriented architectures are about the link between business process and data. Yeah, OK, they, they will draw on vision, mission, and strategy. But enterprise architecture covers the whole stack. And I think one of the important things to remember as somebody who's leading enterprise architecture or an EA initiative is you, as the enterprise architecture person, doesn't have to actually do all this stuff, but you do have to be aware of it. But your focus is up here at the top, making sure the whole activity is focused on where the organization's going and what its priorities are. It is about taking a holistic view. Okay. I'm just looking at the notes. Yeah, those look like some questions about how Collaborate works. So I think that's OK for the moment. Good. Um, so we talk about starting with a view of the business. This is a very simple view of Liverpool John Moores University. Um, I guess some of us have seen this before. And it could probably describe most institutions around our table today. And at the center is what it's there for, students and their life, learning, teaching, and assessment, research, and relationships with um, commercial partners. And in their case, um, they identified very clearly by thinking about the organization in this way that they had, had an issue with uh, the student experience, the student journey or life cycle. Um, something that will be familiar to, to many of you. It's important to take that to the next um, level in thinking about enterprise architecture. And there are two very useful concepts that are explained in the book by Vile Ross and Robertson, which many of you have used as our Bible. Um, the book Enterprise Architecture as Strategy. Can I just check who's, who's familiar with that book, who's had a look at it? so far, to take a cross. OK, we'll show, a, show what it looks like a bit later on. Um, it's about 15 or 16 quid from Amazon. And it really is worth getting hold of and dipping into. Um, just don't try and read it all in one go. OK, so <coughs> that. <coughs> Part of what they say is the approach you take to enterprise architecture depends on how your organization is structured. And without going into the detail, it strikes me that most universities follow what's called here the unification model, where you have a single operation with different departments doing more or less the same thing with access to common data, i.e., about the student. Um, although there may be exceptions, like if you have a business school, an MBA school, for instance, which works completely differently and may have its own systems or a specialized research operation. But do give some thought to the sort of organization you are and acknowledge that publicly, because it is part of getting people to understand why it's necessary to work to a common plan. Um, <coughs> Viol and Ross also talk about the core diagram which always starts with a customer and operational focus view and then links it to the technical bits. And you'll see the technical bits, which are really only about devices and databases, sit in the middle. But what they focused on is what the organization actually does. This was actually Delta Airlines when they decided to transform themselves in order to survive about 10, 15 years ago. Um, conventionally, you'd try and describe what the organization does. This is pretty obviously for an airline, but you might talk about what you observe the student doing. But very interestingly, they've started at the bottom here with the customer experience. And the whole strategy was about turning the organization and its information round to enhance the customer experience um, right the way through from 
uh, sky miles, as they call them, through reservation, through to making the flight and collecting their bags, hopefully in one piece, at the end. And sitting down with a senior management team to actually create this kind of diagram for your own institution is always a, it's a very fruitful and interesting experience because it gets people to think and speak with one voice about what their organization does. Then you can begin to move on to how you organize the stuff in the middle to serve it. But the starting point is the organization and its customers. OK, so Sam's put up a link to the Violin Ross book. There's also, there are two others I'll mention, one on, one on um, governance and one on um, managing IT for strategic advantage. OK, so I just want to finish this section with a few thoughts on why we talk about architecture. Uh, one thing many of us know already is that enterprise architecture, the actual words, can be a little bit of a, a turn off. Um, it seems very technical. But basically, um, my suggestion is that architecture is a response to complexity. Here are the um, Pennsylvania Amish uh, building houses according to tradition. They don't need a designer. They know what to do. They just need to organize those themselves to do it. If you build something like the Shard, you've got a highly complex uh, structure, environment, design for people and living and working. And that requires some pretty high grade um, architecture skills. And if you think about it, so huts to houses to cities, uh, we talk about naval architecture when uh, ships moved from dugout canoes to the battleships around uh, the time of the King's Henry. You talk about aircraft architecture, organizational architecture, car platform architecture, why a Bentley and a Volkswagen can work off the same reusable platform. Um, IT architecture has been around a while. Uh, and now we're talking about enterprise architecture. And in our sense, it's a response to increasing complexity, obviously reducing cost, improving performance uh, by being joined up. We've mentioned being joined up, but particularly by being able to reuse things you've created before that you've cataloged and stored and where you understand what they do and what they, they link to. Um, who else does enterprise architecture? Um, these are some of the large organizations I've been working with over the last six months or so. You'd think there's very little about Shell or Boeing or um, BT Health, for instance, that's similar to university. But actually, they, they face exactly the same issues as, as we do, just with a lot more noughts on the end. I was going to add in in revenue and customs, who I'm also working with at the moment. But um, if you've tried to phone them up recently or read the papers about it, they're probably best left off. So that's some of the big organizations that, that do this stuff. Roughly, probably getting on for about 40% of large companies take this approach to strategic change involving IT. So that's a quick kind of. Um, bit of revision on what EA is about. If, if you are new to this subject um, and coming into it cold, I hope that's given you a bit of an idea. But do go back and have a look at the introductory webinar from March that you can access through Will and Andy's blog. Any questions so far? We're all OK. Good. So let's move on to our, our roadmap and start with the um, introductory roadmap. Good. OK, so there's a direct link there. Thanks, guys. Let's have a look at this. Firstly, who are we? Um, EA is about people and their will to make things happen. And these are some of the people who um, have been part of our journey. Um, <clears throat> there are two kinds, really. There are senior people who had the ability to change the organization in a sort of top-down way. And I'm thinking of people like John Townsend, at John Moores, and uh, Chris Cobb at Roehampton. But mostly, it's people 
in anywhere from junior to middle management who have spotted an opportunity and have to go about bringing about change and getting people on board. Um, so I think those types of job description will probably cover most of us here today. Um, I've not covered people doing development or analysts, and we, we've had many champions from that. Uh, can you think of any job descriptions that aren't covered in that that list there? Just bung them into the chat window if you if you do. No. Okay, what is interesting is how many of the people who started out down this route have moved on and up in their jobs by taking what seemed like a risky step at the stage. Um, and, and in many cases, colleagues, and certainly colleagues in this room today, um, have gone on to get promoted and begin to take leadership positions where they can be more influential in bringing about change. So this is very much about a professional journey, a personal journey. It isn't just a process journey um, in organizational terms. Uh, this agenda is one we shared in the EA practice group. It's been around for about 18 months now. It seems pretty stable. And management means this is the kind of main things you need to know about and be able to do if you're leading the charge. Practice means you're actually doing this. You're modeling things. You're working things out. You're doing architecture. You're doing the more technical work. And there are some that span both governance, obviously, and managing benefits and value. Um, it's not necessarily inclusive. So if you see anything there, that you think is missing, that you think you want to know about, or is, should be on the chart, then please just add it into your chat window. Um, what is common is that enterprise architecture is about managing change. It's about getting your organization from A to B, or as is to, to B. And I would say that anybody involved in this, whether you are sitting with your internal customers working out what bits they use and how they join up, or whether you are trying to get the senior management team on board, you do need to understand that this is about managing change. And it's a complex and tricky business, because most people, by nature, don't like change, especially in uh, difficult times like these. Um, if you have any particular questions on change, then I know Fleur Caulfield's um, done a lot of work in this area, has been, um, is something of an expert. And I hope Fleur, you'll chip in if there are some questions there. OK, so yeah, thank you, Fleur. Lots of, yeah, lots of laughter. Lots of LOL, we, know, we now know, means laughter, not love, doesn't it? Or does it? whatever David Cameron thought. There we go. So this is our agenda. And I'm going to pick, I will cover most of these at some point uh, today. But if you are managing and leading EA, these are the areas on the left you need to have some comfort with. OK, back to the road to value, uh, our familiar friend. It's our simple. Um, almost crude description of our road, our, our journey. And the important thing that we're all trying to get to is level four, the achiever, where you're getting the first results value that people can notice and begin to be happy about. So I think if I think about who's here today, we're probably everywhere from certainly one to four. There is a view that you can never get to five because the, the, the journey is never done. You're always learning. But I know there are people here who've been doing this stuff for probably three or four, three or four years now. Could we just see how many of us are explorers? Let's try this. Um, if you're an explorer, could you just click? Can we have a tick, guys, please? Hi, David. It's Will. I'll just come in here at this point. Um, I've set up the poll to be A to E, so people could actually oh, right pick then. their level. Oh, why, do, why, why don't we do that, then? If so, A, do one to A, five, A to E, just, letters, so. 
Yeah, just just poll for where you are on this. Just click A to E for where you are on this journey. Okay, so yeah, fairly well towards the beginning. And, and again, if we get if if any of this does become confusing or mysterious, please ask your questions. We'll have a we'll have a pause in a moment for any questions. Okay, that's interesting. So there's a, a sort yeah, on to yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And here yeah, I had a think about how that management agenda actually planned out along the road. What you sh what should you be focusing on when you're starting? And so here's a view. Um, I don't claim this to be definitive, um, but it does emphasize that when you're getting going, you're doing, as well as finding out what's going on yourself, you must be talking to a lot of people in the organization and understanding how it works. How do the politics work? Where are the thick, the thick walled silos? that you need to break down, or perhaps avoid to begin with. And then you'll begin to make a case for doing something. Uh, make sure you've got the backing of people who make the decisions through governance. And then you begin, begin to develop stuff like your architecture vision and principles and so on, and get on to doing stuff that makes a difference. Uh, leadership is a requirement throughout, because you will become seen as the face of enterprise architecture, even if you don't call it that. And later on, you'll begin to think about professional capacity and how you develop this from being just you or one or two other people to getting a whole group of colleagues involved doing this stuff and understanding it. And it is very important because if you are, if you do remain the sole person doing this stuff, um, you, it's not going to be very robust. When you move on, so will it. Okay. So these are the sorts of stuff uh, people around the community are using enterprise architecture for. And I'll em emphasize uh, the John Townsend dictum here. You don't do an EA project. You do a project or a program using the enterprise architecture approach. Um, I've highlighted ones that seem to come up time and time again. The student experience clearly is a is a familiar one because um, our customers are paying three times as much and we've got rather less money to serve them with. Really important. But one common feature about these areas is that they do cut across cut across the whole organization. They do not just live within the IT department. They all involve change of some kind in behaviors as well as processes and systems. And the change has the opportunity to deliver big benefits. Um, we also talk of the idea of a burning platform. Um, I no prizes for guessing that does come from the oil industry when something is so broken that it really is threatening the whole organization. And if you can find one of those and help put the flames out, it's a pretty good way to get going with the EA approach. Uh, many of these programs also are using or moving into service-oriented architectures to pull together diverse data from around the organization uh, using open standards most often without having to replace the whole lot. Okay, so this is quite an interesting slide I found. I met I met at um, a recent conference a guy called Thomas Obitz who used to be with Infosys, uh, now with KPMG, and not about three years ago he led quite interesting research survey survey into enterprise architecture, which I have got a copy of, and if you want to get in touch with me, I'll mail that to you. And he looked at the technical areas that people did EA in. Forgive the, the slides. I've had to do screen grabs off, off a PDF. But hopefully, when you have a chance to look through it, um, you, you, you'll see these more clearly. 
but basically the work that's going on is about integrating stuff. The most most of the work, the most frequently quoted work and focus areas is about integrating work across the organization, business processes and data for access. Now these are mostly commercial companies, um, but the top half are basically those about bringing the organization together. Lower down you've got some of the more technical and um, IT related stuff. So this just emphasizes that out in the bigger wide world, outside our ward garden, enterprise architecture is about joining things up. We'll look at some more inf interesting information from that survey as we go on. Um, finally, just a word about mat maturity in another way. This again is from Ross, Vile and Robertson. And they say that the evolution of information systems or digital platforms go through four stages from silos where everybody does their own thing, standardized technology where typically you're using a common email system or um, a registry system, and to one called optimized core where you're beginning to use um, common systems, not just common technology, uh, to run common business processes across the organization. Business modularity means you have an architecture built up of pluggable bits of functionality, services, data, um, user services. And there's the kind of holy grail of building digital platforms that business work businesses operate on. Uh, but one of the interesting things they found in their research is that, firstly, moving from one to the other, you get about a 15% gain in efficiency and productivity but it's almost impossible to move more than one step at a time. If you're down here, it would be very tempting to move to a broad new world in one go. Don't do it. Um, the organizational issues in bringing about that change are too great for it to work. And there are many case studies of organizations that tried to make too big a leap and fell down the crevasse in the middle. If you are working in silos and there's a drive to go to cloud, then you are building uh, your, your, bu your new building on a shaky foundation. OK, so having introduced a few ideas, things that you need to understand and be aware of and where you can find them, uh, I'm going to move on just briefly to professional framework can talk about TOGAF and professional certifications. But before we do, have you got any questions you'd like to ask now? OK, so you've been doing some work on leadership. That's good. That will be great when it comes. Any questions from what we've been looking at so far? OK, good. So let's just <coughs> quickly take a look at framework. Just a few slides here. And um, this is some more information from the Infosys um, survey. They looked at what frameworks people use. Uh, I found this quite interesting, but not surprising. The main ar architectural process framework people are using is TOGAF, the Open Group Architectural Framework, which we've we've had a kind of a bit of a love-hate relationship within this community. But I think once most of us have realized you can adapt it to the way you want to work, it's actually become quite useful. Um, so they found this was used by about a third of organizations. But also, getting on for half, we're using ITIL. And um, I know ITIL is, is it's <coughs> Excuse me while I cough. A service management framework is quite widely adopted in our sector. So, could we just take another look? Can we do an A, B, C, D, E poll, Andy or Will, on A if you're using TOGAF and B if you're using ITIL?
OK, so roughly a third using ITIL, TOGAF. Oh, creeping up. I kind of expect that with the fact that most of us are at the beginning of the journey, and we wouldn't have got to that yet. But ITIL clearly has got quite a following. Oh, someone's changed their mind. There we go. Good. So just as a reminder then, <coughs> this is the architecture development method of TOGAF. And it is basically a process framework. It's an iterative framework <coughs> that starts with your preparation, your exploration for doing enterprise architecture, and then your statement of vision and principles of what it is you're trying to achieve. And the hierarchy is you look at your business architecture first, then your systems and services, and only then begin to look at technology. But all the time, you're being informed by business requirements. I know in doing pro projects and programs, it's quite easy. OK, so go for the work the institution still focuses on TOGAF. Yeah, definitely. Good. <coughs> um, I know one of the issues, without mentioning names, is it's quite hard to get business people interested in a project beyond the initial conversation. And the evidence is if your program proceeds without checking back that you're in line with the requirements, uh, there's going to be disappointment at the end of the day. So this really is at the heart of the process. Um, how do people use it? What do they do? Well, John Moore's found TOGAF most useful for getting the initial stages right and for making sure that opportunities and solutions are joined up that take account of what's already there and what other parts of the organization um, need. So for them, TOGAF was a particularly powerful tool in getting the strategy right, the governance right. And they have a well-developed program management approach for using um, MSP for managing this stuff. And they're planning to use ITIL for service delivery. Uh, Roehampton, on the other hand, and I know John will correct me if I'm wrong here, found TOGAF most useful in the early stages of the process, getting this stuff right, getting the stack from the original vision through the development of the business architecture, the process architecture and the way it related to systems and services and the underlying technology. OK, thank you, Sam. So that's, um, that's another Sam. And it's good to see um, Fleur and Sam Rowley. We're a, you're a gang of four now, not just a gang of two. Yeah. OK, and thank you, John King, for chipping in there. Um, if you want to explore further about TOGAF, have a look at the stuff on the Open Group website. Get hold of the little executive summary book. You can download the whole thing, but do not try and read it in one go. Or you can have a look at Just Enough EA, um, a quirky little publication that we created about um, eight just over a year ago, uh, based on the stories of four of our institutions talking about how they got go going doing um, enterprise architecture. I think, I think it's true to say when this was first produced with its kind of Wild West look, it nearly created a riot um, in certain parts of JISC, but we, we just plowed on. It's quite, it's quite an easy and fun read. OK. So if you're going to use one enterprise architecture framework, do, by all means, have a look at Zachman, which is about creating architectures. But I think you'll find what we all have done. Um, it's been rebranded since. Shame on you. Shame on you. Uh, so if you can get a bootleg copy of the original, um, hang on to it. It could be very valuable one day. Um, so it's been rebranded. Changing, yeah, yeah. The effort required to get the vision right, yeah. And how and how powerful Fleur it is when you do. Do you, um, Fleur, do you want to say anything at this this point? Do you want to add any 
comments there about change in program management. Make a change from hearing me. How are we doing for time? Yeah, we're OK at the moment, I think. So, Fleur, do you want to? Andy and Will, can you we bring Fleur in on sound? Hi, Fleur, it's Will. You should be able to turn your mic on now, if you want to give it a go. Let's click talk at the top. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello, Claire. Hi, sorry. Um, I'm trying to get to grips with Illuminate and I'm not really winning. Actually, it doesn't like me at all. Um, no, I mean, Staff University have been going through four years now of looking at how we do sort of um, change management, program manager, and bringing it all together under the TOGAP sort of um, approach. Um, we have written, as already been mentioned, I've written a, a, a document about it, writing about um, using program portfolio and project management. I've got that the one way around straight away. But it's, it's been an interesting journey um, and it, it's quite a difficult one and it has been for Staffordshire anyway on, on how we get that sort of requirements management and, and the solutions in place when the university doesn't have an overreaching change management department, but we have now we're just in the process of getting a head of change management for the university, and we're going to go and talk to them about all the experiences we've had. Um, and we are writing a document about that at the moment, and there is a blog post on it. <laughs> so we have we, we've done a lot of work on on getting things together, but it, it's been mainly for, for us about communication about going out and talking to people and making sure everybody knows what's going on in the in the university and it's been face to face and it's been it's been a lot of effort and <laughs> um, like I said a lot of communication. Uh, it tends to go in, in cycles. I think the, the university itself has had a lot of uh, uh, organisational disruption, I think is the, the term we're looking for. Um, oh yes, hang on, I'll put the blog up now. Um, excuse me, I don't know if I can type and I think that's it. Um, yes, 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 Andy, as, yeah, the joined up thing. We are we are doing some some workshops within the university as well to promote the joined up of everything and, and getting the visions together. I mean, we really struggled with getting the vision together because of the organisational up upheaval going on. Um, but we've been lucky because we've had the sort of the refree because of that. So we've been able to take a step back and take a really good look at where we are at the moment, whereas institutions, I think, find themselves in a state of constant change and constant sort of innovation and, and, and moving forward. And it's sometimes difficult to get a clear picture of what's going on at the right level um, and make sure you've got that change. Um, I'm going to stop talking now because otherwise I can talk all day about this. <laughs> um, but if anybody's got any questions, um, I'm always always on the end of an email or a telephone call. Um, and like I say, there is a, a blog with a quite a bit of change management stuff on. Um, uh, there is an article um, in the Joint Informatics Journal <laughs> but you can but you can um, read as well. So I'm gonna go now. Bye. <laughs>
but it's it, it, it's it's good to hear that story. We'll we'll leave the Chinese universities to another webinar, I think. Um, that's a, a bit of an in joke. So thank you. For <laughs> yeah, good. Um, what what does this mean for us as professionals, and how do we know where we stand? Um, we've had a little bit of a look at professional standards and assessing where we are, but we've probably done more about benchmarking our organizations than ourselves as professionals. So I just want to point you in the direction of two quite interesting resources. Mike the Architect is a chap called Mike Walker, who's a senior vice president with Microsoft and one of the heads of enterprise architecture. And unusually for a Microsofty, he is an absolute advocate and evangelists for open standards in professional and a great fan of the open group, all of which are surprising. If you look around, you'll see some of his webinars on his blog. And it really, really is worth listening to. And he's done a lot of thinking about professional certifications, uh, starting with TOGAF. He looked at, um, just looked at job ads in the UK and found that round about half of those in senior IT positions required TOGAF as, um, as a standard. And he reckons it's actually used by 80% of organizations, not, not 35. So have a look at that and begin to think about what the profession actually means and what it means for your own knowledge, understanding, and uh, professional qualifications. Um, amidst his stuff, this is a quite neat chart he created of the different types of um, professional qualification, um, authorized ones. So they're certified. You get a certificate or a, a gong or a medal of some kind. Where there are these at the bottom underpinning uh, enterprise architects' work from MBAs to ITIL qualifications and um, project management. And then at the top end, um, that there is the Open Certified Architect qualification or certification, which is based on experience, what you've done uh, rather than what you've known. And somewhere here over on the right, I reckon, are where uh, Sphere or the BCS qualifications lie, um, both of which map onto and are mapped onto from um, both the Open Groups, Open CA, and Open, open Certified Architect and Open Certified IT Specialists here, as well as TOGAF. So if you go to his blog site, just have a browse around at that. It is very interesting. I don't think we've done enough work on it in this community. And perhaps next time we actually get together face to face, we can look at what a professional standard or a subset of it within our HE community actually means, and therefore what it means for your learning journey and the kind of learning we might do together. OK. So I think that's um, pretty much the end of our look at the management agenda, um, the stuff you need to know about, and um, a short session on us as professionals. Now, we're roughly halfway through, just under halfway through. So firstly, um, good is doing document training. That would be good, yeah. OK, not doing the exam. Yeah, OK. So further, that would be good would refer to what? Can you just? clarify there. Yeah. I th yes, I think it, it is about training journeys. It's also about the professional journey, the type of jobs you move between, and whether they're technical jobs or, or management and leadership type jobs, as I know a number of us um, in this call are going through at the moment and to good effect. So like I said, we are about halfway through. Um, we're going to move now on to our three key topics. Um, anyone like to answer, ask any questions?
All good here, thank you. Is anyone feeling totally confused? It's allowed. Anyone totally confused, just hit the tick. Well, you're being very polite, so thank you very much. Um, another question. Um, we do have the opportunity to take a five minute break if we want to for a refresh. Uh, we will finish just before two, by the way. Um, but if you if you fancy taking a break, will you just hit the tick, please? Okay, so that's getting on for half. And Andy and Will, what do you think? About about five minutes? Yeah, I think that will be spot on, uh, dear. I think just give people a, a little breather and uh, and then regroup. And we can so set the timer as well, so everyone can come back at the, the same time. So if we take five minutes from now, which takes us to um, two or three minutes past one. Yeah, okay. I'll set the timer and I'll also pause the recording. So, yeah. watch the Brilliant. timer, folks, just to re regroup. See you in a few minutes. Well, hello everybody, and hello everyone, and welcome back. So now let's look at the these three key things that tax us. And I think if there's one that we've spent more time on than any of the others, it's this question of engaging colleagues, whether they are within the department, um, working for us, and more particularly senior management, whose support we need, not just to provide the resources or the agreement for us to go down the enterprise architecture road, but also obviously to mandate that the rest of the organization will follow. So what's going on here? And um, how can we make progress? Um, in meeting together in face-to-face -face sessions, we do ask everybody to share their challenges as well as successes. This was Joe Smith from University College Falmouth. What were the difficult things they were finding? And as you can see, um, most of them, three quarters of them, were about change and understanding and support and actually getting the message across. My own view is that whilst um, much, mostly enterprise architecture is coming out of an IT background, and that's strange to organizations. And IT people generally tend to talk in technical language more than business language, although we, many of us here, are, of course, rare exceptions. And business people certainly don't expect this kind of stuff to be coming out of IT. Who are you to talk about change? Um, and that's why getting the communication style right that works in your particular organization and climate is so important. Just a word on change from the Middle Ages to a little more recently. Um, oh no, let's, let's look at this. Um, talking with the large companies I mentioned before, I asked them, what are the biggest challenges you faced in doing enterprise architecture? And this is what they said, and surprise, surprise, the majority of their comments were about linking up with management, getting management support, demonstrating value, understanding what architecture is, um, breaking out of IT to talk with business. So this isn't something that's peculiar to universities and colleges. It seems to be common when IT people, however forward thinking and um, professional and competent venture into the world of business management and business people. Um, and like I said a few moments ago, it is about change. So here was uh, Machiavelli in his marvelous book, The Prince, writing in the early 16th century. Um, 
And he goes on to, yeah, it, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand or perilous to conduct. And he goes on to say, because most people profit by the continuation of the established order. If you get a chance to read this little book, do, by the way, it's a great read, but get the Penguin edition that translates it into everyday English, not just the translation from the Latin, which is pretty much um, unreadable. Uh, the Latin even more so. Um, Joseph Schumpeter is an Austrian economist who left for the US in the mid-1930s, and he wrote widely about um, the, the dist creative destruction of innovation. And again, he says, it's not knowing how to do things that matters when you do something new. Um, it's not about being clever, but of willpower and personal e effectiveness. Which probably explains why entrepreneurs, rather than scientists, end up rich when it comes to the field of innovation. So this is something to do with communication, language, <coughs> and a willingness to learn. Quite often, you will find your senior management is interested in the message. They're listening very hard, but they don't actually s understand what we say. Um, because, in general, if we ask a colleague to describe in 10 seconds that you might have in a lift what enterprise architecture is, some kind of technical words will come out. And whilst they're trying to tune in, they'll end up um, tuning out. So it is very important to think about who your audience is. In some of our meetings and workshops, we've actually run a kind of Dragon's Den session where we prepare a short pitch. Uh, it's a little bit edgy, but it is very interesting, and it does tend to work. When you're thinking about approaching somebody who you want to get on board, obviously work out who they are, but think about what it is you want to achieve with them, and what are they like as individuals, what kind of things switch them on, what interests them, what's the difference between talking to an FD and talking to a head of faculty or a head of registry, for instance, what language do they respond to, do they prefer words or pictures or just being talked to in a quiet conversation. Do prepare so that we don't, you don't, as we say, get caught short in the lift. You're asked a question, somebody heard about what you're doing and you didn't think about it before and you blurt something out that, you know, you wish you hadn't said. So who are we talking to? Think about a short description of enterprise architecture or whatever you want to call it in your organization. Use real examples of projects that you know are important. And when somebody says, well, what do you actually do? Have some answers ready, some practical things you can actually do on Monday. Um, so who gets involved in this? Um, business people, IT people, analysts. And increasingly, I'm seeing um, change managers and leaders, as well as project management offices. I noticed recently, some of you might know this, De Montfort recently brought in a head of business change. They've just appointed an enterprise architect who reports to the head of business change. Sounds a little bit like the way um, Staffordshire is going. What do we get out of this? Think about it, and we'll talk about benefits in a moment, and have an answer ready. So what would you like me to do next? What approach do we take? Um, do we get people together internally? Do we just have a quiet conversation by the water cooler? Um, do we go from the top down, or do we go bottom up? I'll say something about that in a moment. Um, do we particular pick a particular project, an aggressive one, that's going to bring huge benefits and change that? Think about the different options you've got. One that I know has been effective has been introducing the JISC Strategic ICT Toolkit, whether with funding, backing, or without, because it does get uh, management, senior management teams thinking about strategically how they use IT, of which enterprise architecture is one of the seven or eight factors. <coughs> and because it's a benchmark, it enables them to see competitively how they stack up against other institutions. I think that's been quite successful. I know that's something Lucy Nelson has done 
Uh, I'm sure she and others will be happy to answer your questions about that. Um, top down or bottom up, do you aim to get the boss involved straight away supporting you? Or do you intend to work in a more subversive, um, insurgent fashion and hope to bring about change that way? Uh, now, the, these are some of the, the, the options I've seen. Top down, on the whole, seems to be more successful with somebody senior in this case, Deputy CIO, 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 you clan, Lucy, I'm not sure quite whether this started with you or your boss. Bolton, it started at the top, and St. Andrews. And where institutions started from the top, they have pretty soon on, usually within a year, engaged the people who are actually doing the work on the ground. Bristol actually got a whole strategy, strategic buy-in set up before recruiting their first enterprise architect. They actually worried uh, about how they were going to move from strategy to actually doing stuff. Others worked the other way around. Certainly Falmouth and Coventry started with um, middle managers or analysts who were adept enough at getting their senior management involved and backing their initiatives. So these two now are backed by CIO level um, support. Where that wasn't done, I think, and it's not sh naming or shaming particularly, people found it a lot more difficult. Um, again, Claire and Sam, I know we've had this discussion many times. I'd, at the time I made this slide, I was assuming you were still more bottom up than top down, but would you like to put in a bid to, to add a down arrow as well now? Are you or are you still where you were there? Yeah. Yeah. And I know what one thing we've discussed, many of us, is that often um, you can't bring about change till there's a, a people change. Um, and whilst it may, you may wish for the vice chancellor to be fired, it's generally not something within your gift. Um, but many of the changes we've seen is when there has been a significant change in personnel, somebody newer, younger, and more ambitious comes in. And do remember that people will give you a very funny look when they hear people from an IT background talking about change and wanting to bring about change in the, the wider institution. So I think our conclusion is, however you start, do start engaging your boss and your senior management and using their networks of influence to get the senior management team on board straight away. Positioning enterprise architecture as an effective established way to bring about change where information is involved, not as some wonderful technical process. OK, that very much is a whistle-stop um, session on communication and getting people involved. Uh, keep it bottom up until, yeah, yeah, I've seen that one. Good, thank you. And again, if anybody's interested, we can, next time we get together, perhaps we can try running one of those sessions where you have a chance to practice um, doing the spiel. I would do Yeah. Yeah, and there was a very interesting example. I had I had the uh, privilege of going and working with UCLan, um, doing a workshop. We had planned to do a workshop for senior management. The judgment there was get a little bit further and get something you can really talk about, because senior management's interested in in results, um, not processes. The abstract confuses them. Yes, absolutely. They're interested in results, not theories and concepts. Okay. Any um, questions on communication? OK, so let's look at <coughs> benefits and 
impact. I'm conscious, by the way, there's an awful lot of stuff coming at you here, especially if you're new to this. Um, do bear with me, have a look at it afterwards, and then, as a number of us have said, pick up the phone um, if you want to have a chat, either to colleagues near you who you might be able to visit, or, or you're very welcome to drop me a line and start asking some questions. So we've been banging away at benefits and impact for quite some time and not getting anywhere. So last July, I got some Sarah Ryu from the John Moores, who's pioneered this, and Natalie Tchaikovsky from Coventry. Yeah. OK, bye, Lindsay. Um, we got them to talk about benefits and impact, and we've run a couple of workshop sessions on it since. Um, Will wants to ask a question. Does Will want to ask a question? I thought there was a raised hand, but I think you might be typing it into the. Yeah, there's something just come through the chat there, David. Yeah, nothing to worry about, David, if you want to come back in there. We lost David. Is it possible David's talking to a room, to himself in a room without the, the talk button pressed? Oh, bugger, yes I was. <laughs> right. Um, Back to you, sorry for that confusion. Do you, thank you, thank you very much. Do you, um, do you have an, uh, the ability to censor rude words when you, or you have to bleep me out for that. So anyway, my apologies for that, talking to myself for change. Uh, benefits and impact. Um, which started with a, a talk from Sarah Rio at John Moore's and actually Natalie Tchaikovsky at Coventry last July. But it is a theme we, we've been hammering away at and wondering why it was so difficult um, before. Um, what I, I've, I come from a business background. What I've observed is that people in HE find it really, really difficult to put numbers, whether it's money or some other measure, to the work they do. It seems very, very qualitative, and I've never really understood why this is. But I do believe that is all going to change. Uh, first of all, we had a session on this at our workshop in March, and we started with the definition of a benefit, and then I think we ended up in about a 20-minute debate about what a benefit actually is, which was quite exciting. I'm not sure where it got us, but it was quite exciting. And I think for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to use this definition from Sarah. A benefit is the result of a change perceived as positive by a stakeholder. In other words, the benefit is in the eye of the beholder. So if your vice chancellor likes a wordy statement, then that's fine. If your finance director wants numbers, then you, you'd, you'd better look at finding some numbers. OK. So a benefit is the result of a change in this case. Um, who are these stakeholders? Well, I'd like to suggest that it's more than you might think, because there is a chain of funding from the government through Treasury, the department responsible for higher education, BIS, through HEFKE and JISC, not to mention your own students, your faculty, and others, and in the middle of it is you carrying the world on your shoulder, wondering how the hell to satisfy all these people. But it is a very interesting exercise to think beyond the project you want to do or the business improvement you want to contribute to, um, to who the stakeholders all up the chain are. I, I believe that I mean, Hef Hefke is pushing JISC very hard to be more impact and benefit minded. If you look at the recent email from the new chief executive of JISC, um, he talks about the importance of impact. And um, what I'd say is, if it's not on your agenda now or your university's agenda, it soon will be. And I believe it's as well to be prepared. 
Okay, so communicating benefits in a language that people understand. Here's a simple framework we've been using for a while, the three E's we call it, or three E's plus three, or E3 to quote one of the sub-brands. Um, we need to describe benefits, but also quantify them. And they do need to be actively managed to make sure they turn up in practice, not just something in an elegant business plan. And we'd say there are three types of benefit, efficient, becoming more efficient, i.e. doing more with less or cheaper, being more effective, doing a better job for whoever your customers are, and enabling, becoming more flexible to do new things more quickly, add new business partners, add an overseas faculty without having to reconfigure the whole of your digital platform. Um, and again, for simplicity, we talk about three types of stakeholder or customer. The enterprise, the people who run your institution, education, the people who learn and are taught, and externally, your funders and your business partners, and sponsors, and customers. And a um, quite interesting exercise to do is to just think about a project or program you're embarking on and perhaps want to talk to the boss about and just write down what these benefits are and see if you can put them into numbers as well as words. It's not practical to do it on this call, but I will show you a couple of examples of what happens when we do. And if we, um, well, if we run this session at the workshop in June, July, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. Yeah, David, so I some close to come in there. I've just put into the chat window um, actually a link to the the combined responses from from the previous yeah. workshop, um, uh, and I'll just reiterate what David was saying about how useful um, GIS projects found this to just undertake a five ten minute mm -hmm. task. Um, it really put into context what they were trying to achieve. So back to you, David. Yeah, thank you for that, Will. And I'm actually going to just show in show those those two slides in a moment, and um, you'll have a chance to look at them in detail afterwards. So some questions you might want to ask yourself. What are the benefits and impact on your place from doing EA in your key projects? And what are you up against in doing it? What challenges do you think you're going to have in describing the benefits and putting some kind of measure to them? So, and, and don't tr say, don't try this at home. This is the first of the charts Will mentioned from our March workshop. If you have got good high eyesight, um, you'll see that there isn't a number amongst them, not a figure. It's all words. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because actually benefits are always first described in words. But it was surprising to me that nobody actually said. 20% um, less spend on IT or a 15% reduction in student um, dropouts. Um, so this is a kind of compendium of the five or six institutions who are in that workshop session. And I'm going to show you in a moment a refined version of that from somebody who went away and then thought about it having been at the workshop. What's interesting is <coughs> here's the emphasis survey again. And they looked, they asked people what basically was your justification for investing in the enterprise architecture approach. Now remember these were businesses rather than universities. But you'll see that all the top justifications were to do with numbers, mostly cost saving, in some cases risk in one case risk reduction, in one case extra revenue, but they were all justified by, um, you know, with reference to some numbers. What's even more interesting is the answers when the survey tried to correlate the degree of senior management support with the numbers of hard metrics um, people collected on their enterprise architecture activities. And it showed very clearly that the more concrete metrics you provide, the more likely you are to be supported. And I think that just refers, relates back to the comment that was made earlier, that senior management don't like fluff. They like hard numbers. And however difficult it is, if you can get to the numbers, you're going to receive a much better 
hearing. Okay, how we do it is another story, but we'll see if we can get to some examples. Um, taking a slightly different tack for a moment, uh, we've touched on the notion of the program office, and it is key, in my opinion, to the ability to not just promise benefits, but actually deliver them in practice. Because only the program office, or the, pro the enterprise program management office, as it's sometimes called, can take a life cycle view of investments in IT to support the business. In a typical project or program, you are either managing a project or a group of projects in a program, and the normal activities plan, deliver, close. In a program office, um, in my observation, you have a portfolio responsibility and an obligation to manage the life cycle of the asset. So it isn't job done as soon as the thing's delivered. Actually, that's just the beginning of the story, because the benefits only come once you're into the life cycle. So managing the portfolio is about uh, deciding where capital is best allocated, scarce capital, uh, amongst a group of programs or projects that stack up and relate to strategic need. But it's also about following through and bringing back projects for review after they've closed and where they're not fulfilling their expectations, deciding what to do about them. You know, cure, kill, or improve. If you are in an environment where you're basically doing program management and project management, uh, but not pr program office approach, then I do think you're going to find it very difficult to demonstrate uh, the value in other than a theoretical sense. So time for another quick poll. Can we just see who is actually using a, a PMO, project management office type approach in their institutions? Just click, click the tick if you are, or the cross if you're not. OK, so yeah, roughly half of us aren't, a few are. Yeah, I, I really would suggest this is something you need to think about. And where I've seen great breakthroughs in the adoption of the EA approach is because people have been brave enough and smart enough to get across the idea that they need a PMO type of approach and actually <coughs> quite often getting themselves into the job um, to do it. Can we just do another sanity check on who actually has an active benefits realization program or activity? Yeah. OK, so mostly no. Um, I think it's worth saying this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not that you're wrong. And it probably reflects the fact that the culture in, in higher education has been such that it wasn't really necessary up till now. Money was not a problem. Now money is an issue. And bringing in something as fundamental a change of this is actually going to be quite difficult. So don't despair if you're not there. But do, in thinking through how you're going to bring about things, consider how you can get benefits management onto the map. OK, so just to recap on that, <coughs> the project benefits must be related to the higher level benefits and ultimately to the aims of the institution. And um, as I said, at project close or project review, do decide what you're going to do to bring things back onto track and make sure you have the backing to stick to that. Um, agreeing that something hasn't worked tends to be a kind of negative experience. It is possible to turn it into a positive learning experience. And there's an important aspect of culture that acknowledges not everything will work out. When, it, when that happens, we need to be constructive in dealing with it. And, and this does emerge as a key activity of the program office. 
You might also like to think about benefits mapping. There is a, a very good toolkit I discovered at Sheffield University. I think we we have or had somebody from Sheffield here today. Anyway, there's some great stuff in this toolkit, benefits management toolkit. It talks about a workshop you can organize to get things started. But basically, a benefit map starts with the enabler, what it is you're going to do, relates to the change that results uh, from that enabler, which results in a benefit which has some kind of impact on the high, the, what the organization's trying to achieve. <coughs> okay, And where you do define your benefits, yes, you'll start with words, but do ch translate them into metrics. So here's one from John Moores. I'm not going to expect you to read this now if you're on a small screen, but um, it should be readable on most notebook screens when you get the slides. But they declare that their corporate aims, the big emphasis, 60% weighting is improved services for students, 30% rebalance and redirect business cost, which means cuts, and 10% academic staff free to add value through more effective admin. And they start on the left with projects and programs. They talk about the changes that result from it, uh, the benefits that those changes lead to, and how those feed into the university's goals. Now, to me, that's, a pretty, that's pretty much simple enough for a vice chancellor to understand, or a DVC, a PVC. And it's very, very clearly showing how these projects and the investment in them will relate to the institution's headline goals. So um, you could just try and do this in workshop with a toolkit. Or again, maybe it's an exercise we'll try in, in workshop two together. Uh, it is actually hard. Sarah and her team say this is actually very difficult to do. When you do do it, you look at it, and suddenly you've got a fantastic bridge between project and program level and senior management. OK, so here's the, the answer, again, from UCLan, where there's a slight modification to the grid, because the stakeholders, the, the particular stakeholders, have been identified this time to remind everybody. And if you look at those benefit statements, pretty much all of them can be translated into metrics staff time and satisfaction, um, retention and student satisfaction, better academic results, very specifically, number of students achieving a first or a 2-1 degree. Some of them are more difficult to quantify, more efficient access to course information. What does that mean? But if you think about it hard enough, uh, I'm sure you'll come up with some sort of measurable metric. Another very obvious one, reduction in those dropping out or changing course, which is a key metric for funders, obviously. And that is probably how a simple your project or program um, benefits map or statement should look. If Lucy is here still, I think Lucy, you are, could you just um, type in what project or program this was actually the benefits grid for, just to give us an idea. Hello, Anne. So for, for, for Anne Rogers from Sheffield, have you have you actually come across the toolkit that I, we've pointed to here? Thank you, Lucy. This, it was the GIST course data pro program. Good. So I just asked Anne Rogers if if um, if you're aware of this toolkit. Good. Okay. <coughs> so hopefully you'll you, you'll be able to come to one of our next workshops and actually help us do some of this stuff. 
Okay. Finally, a word on why this is difficult. Um, what our friends at John Waltz have said <coughs> and others that within what well, they say that higher education culture, but I think this may apply to the broader public sector as a whole. Targets and measures that are linked to individuals are kind of infradig. I don't know if they're a dirty word, but being held to account, I've heard this said many times, is actually not something we like doing. Um, on the other hand, people do like a way of proving how good they are, how well they've done. And the real balancing act is to make it acceptable to underperform um, as long as you then work out what you need to do to perform. But in measuring, be careful to celebrate successes as well as failures or problems. And um, Sarah also advises, <coughs> uh, be careful that measurement and benefits doesn't take on a life of its own. Measure what you can measure, or I would add, what you need to measure. And because EA is a discipline, it's a professional framework, um, I think it does provide the opportunity to build in benefits, measurement, benefits and impact, measurement. OK, well, I think we're doing fine for time. We've got about 20 minutes to go, and we've got a short talk on governance. Um, hopefully, we'll get there before everybody's brain is fried, and we'll have time for some questions at the end. Okay. Any, um, anything on benefits realization so far? Anybody want to say something or ask something? OK, so just to check, I have a feeling in our poll, governance was the least popular of the number ones. Can we just perhaps ask now, for who, who, who is governance an issue for? Who's got this on their uh, agenda, feels it's important? Just click the tick if it's on your agenda. OK, 6 to 4 at the moment. We'll keep it brief um, in that case. Um, if it's not, perhaps it should be, um, because it does ultimately relate to your ability to get things done using the enterprise architecture approach. There's a particularly good book by uh, Vial and Ross again on IT governance, and this is IT governance, not enterprise architecture governance. And basically, they say governance is about decision making who makes what decisions, and how, and how people are held accountable uh, to achieve the behavior you want in the use of IT. Um, interestingly, the book title talks about managing decision rights for superior results. And the research that the book was based on indicated that companies using a more effective approach to governance tended to do 20% better in measurable terms than those that didn't, whether it was productivity, profitability, or other key metrics. What I would like to add is that governance is also about how decisions are stuck to, how you stick with them and, and prevent backsliding, or if there is a genuine reason to vary from policy, that those exceptions are managed in a proactive and explicit, and dare I say it, open and well communicated way. So people have written books and essays and PhD theses on governance. It's basically about decision making. And there it will almost certainly be some IT governance structure or framework in place in your institution now. Architectural decisions 
um, fit into that framework and must be part of it. You should not be considering enterprise architecture governance in isolation. So what do people decide? The high level stuff, the basic principles about strategy, the kind of ten commandments of how we do things around here. Architecture decisions, the organizing logic as it's described. Um, how do we join things up? What is our policy? What must be integrated? What can go its own way? Um, and, then, and then more operational dis decisions on infrastructure. Um, commercial decisions, how to, where to invest and how to prioritize that. And particularly to what services and applications do we need to meet business needs. Um, this was a slide from John Townsend, who's probably taught us more about governance than anybody else. Um, he talks about business applications. I think John would now actually talk about business services and say that internal customers shouldn't be coming to you in IT and saying, I want this application. Uh, they should be educated to say, I need a service that does this to meet my business needs. Um, quick snapshot of some information principles, how we do things around here. There's also some good information on how principles work in the TOGAF pocket guide and basically enables you to apply an acid test to what's a good principle and what's not. But basically they must be actionable, they must have an effect, and you need to be think of an example of when they would apply. Um, Classically, information is a valuable shared institutional resource. In other words, it's not owned within silos or by departments, but it's there for everybody's benefit. But clearly, somebody must be the curator of that information, so it maintains its integrity. There's a lot of great stuff at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, by the way, in the States, and there people are active in ITANA, the, U the US-based network for um, IT and enterprise architects in higher education, and any 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 of you can can join in that forum and get their posts and take part. This is another good one. We have a common vocabulary and data definition. How often do we speak in different languages and therefore not understand each other? Which means creating glossaries or adopting standard glossaries. And th these these are the principles that inform. Uh, the way the development of the digital platform, the IT platform, is um, driven. Um, understand how things work around here. How does your organization make decisions? Is it um, a, a monarchy of some kind where a group of senior persons, people, or maybe just one, make the decisions and rule by diktat? Um, at the other extreme, is it feudal, where your faculty leaders do what they like, um, or is it more federal, federal, where the functions, the faculties, and the administrative departments work together with senior management? Um, whichever it is, the way you get architectural decisions made and implemented. Um, will be a f will need to fit into that pattern, and it's quite quite it's quite it's quite fun to try and work out which, which of these your institution fits. Are you an anarchy, for instance? Well, people would like to be, but clearly that's not going to be a road to a prosperous future. So here's how I'm going to just show you quickly how John Moores do it, how Bolton do it, and how. Bristol do it. This is a classic Val and Ross type approach where there's a strategic steering group, a programs group run by the program management office, and a steering group for operational stuff, getting things done. Uh, the program office is driven by the managing successful programs approach, and the steering group by ITIL and the strategy group by, I would like to think, common sense, but high level architectural principles. And it's these two, the red circle and the green circle, where the EA basically gets done. And note that the senior group is 
establishing principles and making the big decisions, but it's also monitoring them, how they're going, uh, whether they're being complied with, and if they're not, what needs to happen. And they're advised in doing so by the enterprise architecture specialists within the program management office. Uh, built and structure <coughs> uh, led by Patrick Riley, who's um, O'Reilly, who's head of IST and libraries, looks nothing like that one. But actually, if you look at it carefully, all the same bits are there. There's the Technology and Infrastructure Committee, uh, where they're looking at the bridge between projects and strategy. And here's the vice chancellor's group and the executive management team who are making the high level decisions. And Patrick's definition of doing enterprise architecture is about maintaining the strategy that's been set, implementing projects and uh, ensuring they deliver their results, um, and being the guardian of the architectural principles and, and making sure they are stuck to. Bristol are looks even simpler. Bristol is an interesting case where the move into EA was led by Luke Taylor, who uh, I guess many of you will know from USIZA, backed by their CIO, Tim Phillips, who we've enjoyed hearing from in one of our meetings, where basically their big decisions are made in a strategic program board and where the operational and enterprise architecture stuff come together within a program management and support activity, um, and where uh, Luke now has working for him, Nicky Rogers, um, Bristol's first enterprise architect, who we enjoyed hearing from at the March workshop, and uh, there's, there's a link earlier on um, to her blog. It's really, really good. She writes about her first year as an enterprise architect. It's like a, a year in the life. Uh, really nicely written in a very, very personal style. So although it looks different, it is again embodying those three main organization and decision-making groupings of strategy, uh, the bridge between strategy and programs and priorities, and the operational delivery and service. OK, governance is a huge um, subject. Um, this has really just been a kind of overview to help you into it or even think about whether it should be on your agenda. But you might like to think about these questions. Um, answers not required now, but is your present governance setup fit for purpose? Will EA fit within it? Is it willing to make tough decisions and see people stick to them? And therefore, what impact does this have on you applying the EA approach to your projects and programs? Does it mean you should be putting some work into fitting in before you try and do stuff? Because if your governance setup isn't ready for you, you're going to have some challenges. And then what do you need to do to make this work? One, um, one thing people in the group have done that's been very effective is where they've been struggling is to get the CIO or deputy CIO from an institution that's doing EA to good effect to talk to their pal in the institution in question. So um, if you are talking to your boss and they're struggling with this, then you'll almost certainly be able to think of, some, of, of somebody within our own EA community um, who they can talk to. And I know that the senior managers we have got on board will be more than happy. Or you can approach them through colleagues you've met um, in a group like this. OK, so that was <coughs> probably the quickest introduction to governance there's ever been. Um, any, any questions just before we, we go on to wrap up? OK, um, in the closing slides, I'm going to show a link to the um, community group we, we have on the Ning platform. And that's actually not a bad place to ask some questions, I'll see if you can get some answers, as well as finding out who else is around. So 
where do we go to find out stuff? Um, what are we going to do ourselves? Firstly, um, if you like learning things from books, then <coughs> here's the short list I think most of us would go for. This is the original Violin Ross book on enterprise architecture strategy. It's written very much from a business perspective. I think it's really excellent. Like all these books, dip into it. Here's their book on governance and decision making. Uh, they've written another one that's less well known called IT Savvy, which kind of brings together the previous two, and it's about how you make a better business um, by being strategic about that your use of IT. It's it's a bit more lightweight than these other two, but if you want to get into something quickly, then think about getting this one. At a practical level, this book by Mark Lankhorst is worth looking at, Enterprise Architecture at Work. Mark's an independent specialist who also um, actually does quite a lot of work with biz design, um, who are very much involved with Archimate training and tools. Um, about how do you use modeling for communication and analysis to get people around a board or a table or a screen. Uh, modeling is outside our scope today. Um, but in case you, you're concerned that EA is being dealt with at too high a business level, there's some really good practical stuff in Mark Lankhorst's book that's worth reading. Governance about decisions. This one, uh, Enterprise Architecture Strategy about change. IT savvy about doing things better. This 20% improvement I spoke of a while. And Mark Lankhorst about being hands-on. Um, there's a growing, well, there is quite a handsome library of resources within JISC. Before you go and read yet more, uh, pick up the phone to somebody when you've got your, your question, somebody else who's been down this road. When you get to the right stage, think about hosting a workshop. It could be a get-together for you and maybe two or three institutions around you. Or it could be an internal one, bringing your business and IT people together. If you want to do that and you want some help, then get in touch with us. There's a host of JISC resources, the main info kit, an earlier knowledge summary. Uh, they don't quite overlap. And I think this one's got a link to the bootleg version of the original Just Enough EA. Sorry, Will. Um, the Ning group, where you'll find out where everybody is and who they are. And there is a, still an Enterprise Architectures mail list, although to be honest, it's not particularly active at the moment because anyone can join it. Uh, I mentioned Itana. Have a look around there and join their mailing list. It's certainly worth doing. Some really good discussions there. Have a look around the open group stuff on, arch on Enterprise Architecture and the professions, by the way. It's quite a good statement of a case for professional development. And of course, there's Mike, the architect, who we've talked about before. Um, or just drop one of us an email. And if we don't know the answer, then as they say, we all know somebody who does. <coughs> OK. Um, actually, Will, do you want to just say something about these two events? Yeah, that's fine. I'll come in here. Do you want to just turn your mic off, David? OK, thanks. So um, upcoming under the banner of emerging practices, we've got a couple of events. Um, they've been alluded to through the webinar today. The first is on the 3rd of July in London. And that's a repeat of the March workshop, which has been mentioned previously. Um, it's specifically for projects funded under GIST transformations and also GIST course data in the first instance. Um, if you're on the mailing list for both of those, you should have heard about it already. Um, However, looking at the list of people who are still in the room, it's possible that many of you were at the event in March or have already been to a similar um, workshop. However, if you're in a phase two or phase three just transformations project, or if you um, did attend the previous workshop and want to send other staff, um, then please do go to the, the booking form and register. There are only 50 places available, um, and we expect it to fill up fast. So um, once I've finished speaking, I'll add in the link to the booking form um, into the chat window. 
the event in September, on the 20th of September, possibly spilling over into the, onto the following day, the 21st, is a much wider event for any, any, anybody to attend. Um, this is intended for people a bit further down the road to value. Perhaps David will confirm, but let's say stage three or stage four, uh, to start bringing people together in a bit more like a practice group environment, um, sharing ideas and learning by doing together. So. Um, further details will become apparent about that um, over the summer. Um, and I'll just reiterate David's point about potentially organizing your own event. If you wanted to host something or to run something, um, then either do so independently or drop us a line if you want some support doing that. Um, we'll, we'll certainly um, do what we can to help out. So there's a quick overview of some things that are upcoming. There are likely to be more. Um, we'll advertise them through GISC program lists and also on our GISC Emerging Practices blog, which hopefully you've all seen by now. So that's me, David. Thank you very much, Will. Um, <coughs> just one comment. Is it worth coming to the second event if you're starting out from cold? Provided you're willing to be baffled for the first half day, Yes, I think it is, and you'll find very sympathetic people who will mop your fevered brow and help help you get into it. But um, if, if you do want to come to that group, you're very welcome, but do make sure you do the homework in advance. OK, so just to wrap up then, we've, we've actually covered an agenda that would normally take two and a half to three days spread over two or three different um, sessions. So if you're feeling a bit brain fried, um, you're perfectly entitled to, it's not surprising. But I hope there's been enough to at least give you a taste, if you're new to enterprise architecture, a taste of what's going on here. And if you've been around for a bit, at least to reinforce some of what you're thinking or point to areas that you might want to hone in on about why we do this stuff and how to think of it as a manager, what is on our agenda, um, the frameworks we might find helpful, and, and then these key topics. But do, do have a browse around the knowledge and learning resources. And as I've said before, do feel free to pick up the phone to one of us, or preferably to pick up the phone to one of your neighbors who's been doing some of this stuff, and who I know will be very pleased to help you. With that, we've actually got a minute for any other questions. Um, OK. Any other questions, comments, statements, observations, please feel free. Great. Thank you. We appoint Fleur as our spokesperson today, very obviously. Thank you, Fleur. And so I'll just hand over to Will to close this um, webinar. Thanks, David. Um, I think David deserves a rather large virtual round of applause. So if we can all find the applause emoticon, that would be great. There we go. Um, a great effort, David, to um, run a, a webinar pretty much single-handed um, for, the, for the best part of two hours. So thank you ever so much. Um, I'm sure everybody values it highly and has taken a lot of useful learning from the session. Um, Obviously, it's been mostly one-way traffic today, but we, we look forward to hearing some feedback from people. That's absolutely fine. This is a difficult topic, and you just need to concentrate on taking in the information. Um, there'll be further information about upcoming events and a summary of this, this webinar and the recording made available soon afterwards. Um, so it just leaves me to say thank you to everyone who attended. And again, thank you for David for presenting. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Speak to you soon.